So let's talk about the different types of wood, right? Because these are actually, these may taste a little different because they're aged not just at two different lengths of time, but they're aged in two different types of barrels, okay? And what we're talking about here, the major differentiation is where does that oak come from? You have on one hand with our bourbon whiskey, American oak, right? There's two different species. One is just white oak and the other one is called Oregon white oak. They were very creative with that one. Um, and it has a slightly different profile than French oak that's used to age cognac, right? Oftentimes, one of the big markers that we notice between American and French oak is that American oak has a lot more of this sort of toasted coconut uh, sort of flavor or aroma to it. Whereas French oak tends to be a little bit more ginger spice, a little bit more chocolate, a little bit more raisinated in the case of a grape, a grape distillate. And you have a lot of other choices too. You could use very large barrels. You could use very small barrels, right? A small barrel does an interesting thing to a spirit, right? It increases the surface to volume ratio, right? More of a larger percentage of your spirit in that tiny barrel is in contact with the wood. And that would change it what, faster or slower, you would think? Faster. Is that always a good thing? It depends on what you're trying to do, sure. What we find is that a lot of the small barrels, which do in fact will ch change, it'll age a spirit faster in the sense that it will become darker, it will um, take on a lot of those oak flavors a lot faster than you would in a large barrel. You'll find that it actually pulls out a little bit more of the bitterness, a lot of the oak tannin. It'll be a much more kind of rough, rough riding spirit. And as part of some of the issue that we have with some of the early on craft distilleries in the US, they want to play with the big boys, so they need whiskey now. So what do they do? Small barrels, you can get there faster. But it always ends up not tasting quite the same, right? We're now at an interesting point where, you know, the sort of whiskey craze, we're about 10 years 10, maybe 15 years in, and some of these small guys are starting to put out some truly tremendous old full-size barrel-aged whiskey, which is really exciting. With cognac, they've been doing this for hundreds of years. So they've got, they've got tons of stuff socked away, slowly waiting for, waiting for its time. Uh, master blending teams, in the case of cognac, the big cognac houses will meet daily, and they are very meticulous about the way that they do this. Uh, and they decide by tasting barrels day after day where these things are going to go and how these blends are going to be put together, right? Now you can also use barrels that are brand new, right? Or you can use barrels that have previously held something else. Yeah, what a, what a barrel has had in it previously can also contribute to the complexity, the flavors, the aromas of what you're putting into it now, right? Now, would you say that a barrel that, say, had, let, 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 let's just say you've, you've, you, you've used a brand new charred American oak barrel to age bourbon. And then afterwards, you take that bourbon out and you put some more corn whiskey in it. How does the, how does the evolution of that spirit in that used barrel differ from using a new one? You said a little bit slower, a little bit more subtle. You said it's going to get a little bit of that, that previous whiskey in there too. Yeah, certainly. I think slower and subtle is, is, is certainly on the right track. Used oak will contribute a lot of those same markers that we're talking about, those same aromas, those same flavors, but at a much slower rate and oftentimes at a much more muted. I think subtle is, subtle is a really great, great way to put that. Uh, and it is a popular choice, especially for certain products that may have a range of 12 to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 years old, right? Uh, it gives you a little bit more time to work with. There's a lot more uh, flexibility with that as you age things. Now, over time, if you use that barrel a third time or a fourth time or a fifth time, it becomes so much more muted that eventually 
well, the barrel becomes what we refer to as neutral. Usually after five or six, it, it won't really give you very much flavor at all, at least of the barrel notes. You can certainly put something else in it, take that out, put something, you know, put some bourbon in it, and then you have a port cask finished bourbon, which is a new thing that's hitting the market now, or sherry cask finished scotch, um, popular thing to do. Uh, so there's lots of different options there. There's a number of different ways that these, these barrels kind of have their, have their life cycle, right? And we'll, we'll talk about a couple examples. So uh, the bourbon industry, by law, and this goes for, for rye whiskey as well, must be aged in brand new charred American oak barrels, right? So uh, let's take a big example of that, and let's take, uh, well, let's go Tennessee whiskey. Let's talk about Jack Daniels, right? So Jack Daniels makes several million bottles worth of, well, probably tens of millions of bottles of Jack Daniels every year, right? So let's just say that's a million barrels that they're making in one year, right? It's a lot of barrels. Where do they go? When they, when they dump that Jack Daniels to bottle it, they can't use that barrel anymore. What do you do? You could throw it away, right? But what would be a more economical way to address that? Sell it. Sell it to Scotland. <laughs> Sell it to a rum company. Right? The company that owns Jack Daniels, Brown Foreman, happens to own a tequila company called Herradura. And so you can believe that they're going to try to make the best, smartest use of those barrels as they can. So they sell it internally to Herradura. Some of them goes off to Scotland. There, there's a whole secondary market for these barrels. And then they get used again. Right? So, and so let's say this barrel travels off to Scotland, right? and in Scotland, uh, it gets used, it's an ex-bourbon cask, it gets used to age scotch whiskey, scotch whiskey for 12 years. And then it gets dumped and that Glenlivet 12 year makes its way uh, in, into your mouth to, to some way, shape or form. What does that barrel do now? What's that? I said it's like finding the email, just like the endless journey. The endless journey, yeah. <laughs> well, you could use it again. And the scotch whiskey industry has an interesting Ter terminology that they use for that. They're, they're calling it first fill, second fill. You'll see those terms thrown around. Mostly this term first fill is very important because it means that this is the first time that that barrel has been refilled after it's initially held something, right? So first fill bourbon casks means that you're probably going to get a, a richer or a not as rich sort of bourbon influence on this whiskey. Richer, absolutely, right? Second fill, third fill, fourth fill, it becomes more and more muted and the barrel becomes less and less desirable and less and less expensive on that secondary market. After about five uses, they can sort of be retired from that. Where do they go from there? You can sell them to Sherry. The Sherry Soleras that they create, not the sherry barrels that go back to Scotland. We'll talk about that in a second. But the Solera systems themselves are set up of racks and racks of barrels, m more often than not, are quite old. In some cases, more than 100 years old. And those barrels just exist to allow the wines to slowly oxidize over time, slowly evolve without gaining that rich tannin, uh, rich color, rich, um, you know, all, all that barely notes. You don't necessarily want that. In a, in a truly great Solera aged sherry. Um, but you need the barrels, right? They can get taken apart. Those, some of those staves are still good to use and you can reuse them and repurpose them in different ways. Um, you, can re you can recycle them, you can turn them into all sorts of different things, right? Um, but they do have a lifespan. French oak generally is, uh, is, is toasted. Very kind of carefully constructed term where they uh, just heat it up and they allow some of that some of, those, some of those sugars to start, start leaching out um, and g give a nice beautiful aroma to that barrel. For bourbon, for example, what they do is they roll these barrels without ends, so it's just the staves hooped together on top of what looks like a giant uh, kitchen range, and they just blast 10-foot tall uh, flames through it for anywhere from 12 to 30 seconds. And it turns the inside of that very dark and very charred. Um, so much so they refer to it as alligator skin because that's what it sort of resembles. It's very rough. Um, and a lot of that will make its way in, into that bourbon, which is part of what gives you a hint of smoke, uh, a little bit of uh, 
a little bit of that, th those beautiful sort of spice notes come out there too. Uh, the major difference between the two is the, the grain of the wood is actually quite different. Um, American oak has uh, much, is it, it's, it's tighter grain, I'm gonna mess this up. Uh, Ameri American oak is more porous and French oak is much tighter um, in, in terms of the grain. So American oak is going to allow a lot more interaction with the spirit as it gets absorbed slightly into the wood and then just gets pushed back out um, as it sits in a, as it sits aging for years. Um, it also has a little bit to do with how you make these barrels. American oak, the, the wood, right, if you cut down a tree, you have a circular log, right? And out of that, you somehow have to get flat boards. So there's a number of ways you can address that puzzle. But with American wood, you can cut it very cleanly and kind of make the maximum number of staves appear out of this round circular log. With French oak, you can't do that. It becomes very brittle and they have to split these along the grain so that they don't, they don't fall apart or, or, or break or, or cease to be watertight. And so you get far less staves. You, you can only get about, I think the yield is like 25 to 30% of staves out of, a, out of a French oak log, whereas it's closer to, I think, 75 to 80% in American wood. And that's part of the reason why that French oak is a lot more expensive than American oak tends to be, even on the secondary market for a little bit longer. Um, it, it doesn't offer as much initially, flavor-wise and, and aromatics-wise, as, as an American oak barrel does, but over time, this on its second, third, fourth, fifth use will still give a, just a little bit more, whereas the American oak barrel sort of falls over and dies pretty quick. Um, this is like that big brutish, like way up front, and then afterwards it sort of backs off, whereas this is kind of the, the, the slow, it just kind of moves along and it keeps doing its thing. Um, but Scotch whiskey is, not as old as, as a lot of us like to think. There was even 150 years ago, it wasn't a well-regarded spirit. Um, and only within the last 100 years or so has it really come into focus as a truly great, truly expressive, and truly complex um, spirit. For a long time, they were making whiskey to make whiskey for themselves. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really an export product. Cognac, since the 1600s, um, they've been making it and shipping it. And since the 1800s, it was known all over the world as like the best in a well-aged distillate. Um, and even today, like more than 90% of all cognac made is exported. Like hardly any of it remains in, in the local market. It's the, it's the opposite for Armagnac. It's strong as all hell, right? It ranges from what, 126 to 137 proof, something like that, right? Well, that's strange because bourbon whiskey by law cannot be put into barrel at more than 125 proof. So over time, because of the climate that it's in, more water will evaporate than alcohol because it's, it's, it's in a drier place and you'll concentrate your alcohol content in that barrel just a little bit, right? Over time, it'll get stronger. On the other hand, let's go to Martinique in the Caribbean where it's very hot and very humid, right? The humidity means that there's so much water in the air that the alcohol in that barrel is going to evaporate faster than the water will. And so over time, if you have Clement 20, uh, well, yeah, Clement 15, for example, it's at cask strength and it's at like 44%. So it's reduced a little bit too. So there's lots of different factors here and, and, and part of the interesting thing is that we've been doing this for hundreds of years and we still don't fully understand what's happening. We can only describe it based on what we put in and what comes out the other side and we taste the difference. We look at all the different factors that contribute to it and we still don't have a 100% clear picture of what's going on, which is part of what makes this exciting. Part of what makes tasting something new tasting something that you haven't had before, or tasting something that has unique qualities that you haven't encountered before, a very special experience, right? Other questions, Andrew? Spirits in your form, but? They still exist. 
There are some old holdouts. Uh, Pisco in, in Peru, uh, they don't barrel age anything. They still use clay uh, to hold their spirits over, t over time, although most are quite young. Um, Chinese spirits, so has, has anyone had baiju before? That is another uh, clay-aged spirit, and in some cases for quite a long time as well. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of a tasting seminar last week with uh, Dave Wondrich, who's a huge nerd, and uh, this guy Dale DeGroff, who sort of started the whole kind of new cocktail renaissance here. And they went to China to visit one of the largest Baiju distilleries. And one of uh, the interesting things, they, they, they were allowed to, they were the first journalists to really visit that place. And they took pictures and they asked questions. This distillery is enormous. This is, this is the best selling spirit category in the world. But almost none of it makes it to the US. And we, most people have no idea that it even exists. But they have 24 uh, Chinese chemical engineering PhDs that work on their, their, their product. They, this, these t this team of 24 PhDs make this product. And Dave asked them at, at one point, well, have you ever tried, have you ever tried aging these, these baijus in, in, in wood to see what happens, you know, after a couple years and, you know, some of those interactions? And they looked like he, they, they looked at him like he had three heads. They had, like, they, it was just not a thing that they had ever considered or even, like, that just didn't make any sense to them. So there are some areas of the world where it, it's still not a, still not a, not, a, not a practice. Although I'm sure as we become more and more connected that you'll start to see some of that experimentation happening. Right. What about Japanese whiskeys? Where are they getting their barrels from? Japanese whiskey has a very strong appreciation of the Scotch tradition. Um, it's where the, the founder of Suntory, uh, he spent quite some time in Scotland training to distill and so they make their whiskies in a very similar way to Scotch so they use a lot of ex-bourbon casks. The unique part about some Japanese whiskies is uh, a native Japanese oak called Mizunara that is very strange and very rare and you probably will never get to taste 100% Mizunara oak aged whiskey, but little bits of it are used to add just a little something extra to things like uh, the Yamazaki 12 year. Uh, Yamazaki 18 has a much larger percentage of that in there. Um, a couple of the Nika whiskeys use Mizunara oak as, as, as well, but it's a very hard thing to work with, to get a hold of, because there's just not a lot of it. Um, and so it's becoming harder and harder to, to get as Japanese whiskeys become more and more popular. And you're seeing some shortcuts being taken too. So Hi Hibiki is their, their blended whiskey, is Suntory's blended whiskey. For a long time, the baseline Hibiki that you would get is the Hibiki 12 year. Now there is a new product called Hibiki Harmony, which is still very good, but it now no longer carries an age statement. They can release it a little bit sooner than having to wait that minimum 12 years. And so they can get a little bit more of it out to the people that really want it, to bars and restaurants to be able to sell. And that you don't have to compete for the one or two bottles a year. And instead, if you need a six pack, you can get a six pack. Um, but that has it, in a, a minuscule percentage of that special oak aged whiskey compared to what you'd find in a 12 year or the 17 or the 21. 